And that's us when we're talking about enzyme structure and function. We will eventually talk about things that impact uh, enzyme function and look at the mandatory practical, but today just these two dot points. All right, we are organic life forms, which means that every single molecule in our body is based around carbon. And carbon is a molecule that is small and it's light and it can bond with so many types of atoms. And because of this, it's our foundational building block. Now, our bodies are made, you know, based on organic macromolecules and they're large and they're extremely complex. And they are made of smaller little subunits, which repeat over and over again to build large macromolecules. Now, all of the macromolecules uh, play really unique roles within the body. And we've spoken about some of these in the context of our cell membrane structure. But we're talking carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and nucleic acids. And you can have a read of a mean. Right, now these complex large macromolecules are made up of those small repeating molecular units. So think of it like a huge string of beads on a necklace. The small monomers are the individual beads. And while we use this analogy, don't forget that we're still actually talking about a smaller molecule made of atoms. Okay, and that's what that monomer would actually be. So these monomers join together and they form small groups and eventually they'll form really long chains of the monomer and it's called a polymer. And once these polymers have all, all the components that they need, they twist and they turn and they bend and they form these big, highly complicated and kind of ugly looking macromolecules. Each of the types of macromolecules are structured from monomers, right, and they join to form polymers, but they all have a unique monomer molecule and the first type of macromolecule we'll talk about are carbohydrates. Now carbohydrates are a type of energy store and they're used for cell to cell recognition and in structural components of DNA and RNA as well. They're made up of only carbons, hydrogens and oxygens. Okay. Their monomers are known as monosaccharides, right? We can see that as part of the word to help us out there. They join together in twos to form disaccharides and eventually they form really long polymers called polysaccharides. Now these simple sugars like the glucose and the fructose and then even to the disaccharides like the sucrose and the lactose. Um, you know, they're the simple ones versus the more complex ones we see over here. Um, in that they're often stored in the body for later use, that glycogen is. And starches are found in foods and they're examples of those polysaccharides, those long complex chains. The more complex the carbohydrate, the slower they are to be broken down in the body. Hence, these foods often have that low GI or glycemic index. Butter is not a carb. Lipids, however, butter is a lipid, and lipids are what we usually talk about as fats and oils, and they too are a kind of energy store, but they hold far more energy in them than carbohydrates. We also know that they're the major component in our cell membrane and every single membrane that wraps around our organelles as well. Now, lipids come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but they're most structured with a head and some tails. Now, this is a triglyceride because it's got three tails, as opposed to that phospholipid that has two that makes up our... Um, our cell membranes. So lipids are insoluble in water, they're hydrophobic, hence why oil and water don't mix, and some other types of lipids are steroids, waxes, and fats. Nucleic acids include all of our DNA and RNA, and that's our genetic material that's used as an instructional code to create proteins, which is our final type of macromolecule. Now, the subunits or monomers which make up DNA and RNA are known as nucleotides, and we commonly refer to them by their, the first letter, so C, G, A, T, and also U. And you can see that they actually build themselves, you know, they are themselves as quite a small molecule, and they build themselves to form that really large, complex strand of DNA. Proteins, they are a final macromolecule and they are incredibly abundant in cells. We're talking between one to three billion protein molecules within one human cell, which is incredibly hard to fathom. Now, we've already seen that proteins are vital for cell membrane transport and structure, but they're also used in cell signaling as enzymes, as hormones and as ribosomes in the cells, which actually helps to build more proteins. Their monomers are amino acids, so amino acids bond together to form um, a peptide which elongates to form a polypeptide, aka a protein, um, and once the polypeptide is formed, they'll actually bend and twist in a very specific way to allow them to perform their role. Some will combine with other polypeptide chains and fold around each other. But our main goal today is actually to discuss one type of protein, which is enzymes. Okay, and enzymes are proteins, and they are globular proteins. They are folded and twisted and often have those extra change. They are biological catalysts. They speed up chemical reactions in the body without actually being altered themselves. So remember um, that in a chemical reaction, we're talking all the things that we're putting together are a substrate, and our end result is our product, and we're aiming to create that. 
Enzymes in this situation uh, help this reaction to occur super fast. So essentially they're just wingmen. Okay. Enzymes are made in cells, but they can be both intra- and extracellular when they function. Basically, everything in our body runs because of enzymes. Everything. Enzymes can only assist with one specific job. Okay, They are the epitome of that phrase, you had one job. Apart from a very few rare exceptions, they do not multitask. Now, the substrate in the chemical reaction will bind to a specific region on the protein known as an active site, and essentially that's a workbench. The shape and the chemical structure of the active site will match perfectly, like a lock and key. Okay, And once the substrates have been uh, turned into the products, the enzyme will release the molecules and free up the active site. And this active site remains completely unchanged, so it can just keep on over and over and over, go with the same reaction. Now, catalysis, right? Catalysis, I'm not sure. It's the process of increasing that rate of the chemical reaction, right? They are catalysts, and it has three main stages. First, the substrate's got to bind to the active site, then the substrate's actually change into the product, and then the product is released. So again, uh, the, the enzyme might be breaking down something, or it might actually be building up and bonding reactants together. Those stages of uh, catalysis or catalysis we can see here. Um, there's often water molecules required in order to form the two new product molecules. Now, when proteins are produced, the exact way that they fold allows them to do their job. And if we're talking enzymes, their folding allows them to perfectly form that active sites. However, proteins are a little bit fragile when it comes to certain conditions, and they can be denatured. If it's too hot, for example, the protein will unravel, unfold, and change shape, meaning that the active site is no longer a perfect fit for those uh, you know, substrates to bind. And if the active site isn't right, then the enzyme simply won't do its job, and it needs its optimal conditions. Now, it makes sense that in order for the enzyme to do its job, it actually has to be in the vicinity of the actual substrate, it needs to be nearby, but the movement of the enzymes and the substrates are entirely random, so the chances that they actually collide isn't that good. If a substrate is in water, it helps and hinders both, you know, those collisions. It allows for the mobility of, of molecules, but it also means there's so much space for them to move around. So because of the difficulty in aligning these substrates and the active site, many things impact the collisions occurring and therefore the overall activity of the enzyme. Right, things that affect enzyme activity include these four here, and that is going to be the focus of our next lesson.